Good afternoon. So was everybody in the morning session? Who, who was not? Three, four, five. Those of you who were not, can you just tell us who you are and what you do? Glad you're here. Who's here new? I'm Brian Patterson. I'm an academic advisor. Okay. Great. Thank you for coming. Anybody else in the back? Yes, ma'am. I'm Alison Bowie, and I'm adjunct faculty at the Great. Glad you're here. All righty. Any questions before we get started? Okay. Well, if you were there, uh, cell phone? Oh, so glad you brought that up. So I have this thing, I have this thing about cell phones. Well, before I tell you that, I want to read something to you because I, I, every once in a while, I mean, as you do, you get all these things sent to you over the email, and, and, and I delete most of it, but every once in a while, something really sticks with me, and if you're in education, you're in education for the right reason, I'm sure. My sister's a teacher. She's taught 30 years, and she does it because she loves the kids and she loves her mission and not obviously for the money. So um, I got this email and it was about kind of loving and how you love and so I thought it would be appropriate for this group since I know that you do what you do because of the love. So anyway, I'll read it to you. It says, just because someone doesn't love you the way you want them to doesn't mean they don't love you with all they have might sound like a student or coming your way and that could that could be a student's opinion of a, of a teacher so this is, this is great about love Ralph and Edna were both patients in a mental hospital that could sound like your students too right? uh, Ralph and Edna were both patients in a mental hospital one day while they were walking past the hospital swimming pool Ralph suddenly jumped into the deep end he sank to the bottom of the pool and stayed there. Edna promptly jumped in to save him. She swam to the bottom and pulled him out. When the head nurse became aware of Edna's heroic act, she immediately ordered her to be discharged from the hospital as she now considered her to be mentally stable. When she went to tell Edna the news, she said, Edna, I have good news and bad news. She said the good news is your being discharged since you were able to rationally respond to a crisis by jumping in and saving the life of the person you love. I have concluded that your act displays sound mindedness. The bad news is Ralph hung himself in the bathroom with his bathrobe and his bathrobe belt right after you saved him. I'm so sorry, but he's dead. Edna replied, he didn't hang himself. I put him there to dry. <laughs> How soon can I go home? <laughs> I like that one. Cell phones. I used to have this real thing about cell phones, and then I went to hear uh, my friend Eric Weinmeier speak, and I spoke of Eric earlier today. He's the guy who climbed Mount Everest who's blind, for those of you who weren't there. Climbed all the way to the top, totally blind, first and only and probably ever person who will climb to the top of Mount Everest blind. Uh, he came to Atlanta to give a speech, and, and I knew him. I had spoken with him before in Canada, and so he got there. And it was a group of 400 doctors that he was speaking to to do a slideshow on his expedition up to the top of Mount Everest. And I hadn't seen the, the slideshow, so I was really excited. So anyway, I, I sat down, waited for him to arrive, and he comes walking in for dinner first. And I realized he came in by himself. I mean, he had a dog, but no people, no entourage, no leader, no nothing. And he sat at the table, and we had dinner, and then, just like just now, someone got up and introduced Eric to the podium. And so Eric got up from dinner, and as he was getting up, it occurred to me that guy got himself from Denver, Colorado, to an airport, on an airplane, in Atlanta, to a hotel, cab, all, dressed himself, all by himself, totally blind. And so he's coming up to give his presentation, and he gets over to the podium, and his dog comes up, sits down, and, and Eric says, before I get going, I, I just want to introduce all of you to my dog, Seago. 400 of them. 
He says, my dog Seago is trained to do two things. Number one, to guide me, obviously, and to lead me and to help me. He said, but my dog Seago is trained to do one, one more thing. He said, my dog Seago is trained to attack. Should a cell phone go off while I'm speaking? Okay, so he told him, he told him. So he gets back here, he starts his slideshow and his speech, and it's phenomenal, I mean, it's unbelievable. And at about slide 11, all of a sudden, in the middle of the room, a cell phone goes off. Eric doesn't miss a beat. He looks over at Seago and he says, Seago, attack! The lady who owned the cell phone jumps up and runs out the back of the room. Seago, the dog, never woke up. So, I don't care what you do with your cell phones. That's the whole point. All right, uh, today what I wanted to do is go through a couple of things. First of all, important to know, if you heard me this morning, that my message is really about making sure these young people that you all work with, whether they're middle school, high school, college age young people, when we turn them loose out there, there, no more walls, that they are prepared. And so, you know, interesting to know that my background is not education. I've never taught a day in my life. I don't have what it takes to teach, quite frankly. As I told you, I have a sister who has taught for a long time, and so I know you have to be patient, because she is. You have to be compassionate, because she is. You have to be unselfish, because I see that in her every day. Uh, and that's just not me. So I, I couldn't do it. So I commend you if you're involved in education for what you're doing. My background is business. Uh, we built the playgrounds for McDonald's. We built, God bless you. We built 3,000 of those playgrounds, and then about 16, 17 years ago, some guy bought our company. And I wasn't sure what to do next, so I did take a trip, as I told the students this morning. I drove around this country for a couple of years. And in addition to meeting a lot of successful people and learning from them, which was helpful, I also ran into hundreds and hundreds of young people, college age, who were close to finishing their college education. And if you got a copy of my book and you happen to read it, you'll see that my education ended after about seven weeks of college and that's all I have. I have a high school degree and that's it. And I'm not proud of that and I don't promote that and I don't talk about it a lot with kids, but it's true and it's important because it makes me look back at my years before that and try to figure out how and where I learned how to do whatever it was I did in business and have continued to do having no more education than 12th grade education. So, and we'll talk about that a little later, but, but it, it, it causes you to stop and think about that. So I met all these people in college, and since I hadn't finished college, I was always curious as to what their plans were upon completion. And so as I traveled around the country, and for those of you who weren't here this morning, I went to 40 different states over two years trying to find myself. And when I ran up against a college student, my question was always the same. Hey, you're going to be done with your education pretty soon. Tell me, what are you going to do when you get out? What do you think 80% of those kids said to me? I don't know. So it's got a choir here. That's good. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Everywhere I went, I don't know, which was frustrating. I didn't understand that, but I kept on driving, kept on driving. I eventually came to Utah, and I pulled into Provo, Utah, and I parked my car down at my flea bag motel where I was staying, and I hiked up to the Sundance Resort that Robert Repter built. And I got up there, I mean, it is beautiful. Blue skies, mountain peaks covered with snow, stream running through there. It is just, like, amazing. And I sat on the bench with my newspaper, started to read. Five minutes later, a girl walked up who looked to be in her young 20s, and she sat on the bench just across from where I was and started to read a book. So I gave it another two or three minutes, and I struck up a conversation with her. And I said, are you up here on vacation? And she looked at me, she said, no, no, I'm not here on vacation. And I said, well, uh, do you live around here? And she said, nope, I don't live around here. And I said, well, what are you doing here? She said, you wouldn't understand. I said, what do you mean I wouldn't understand? She said, you wouldn't understand. And all of a sudden, she took on this kind of sad look. And, and I said, why don't you give me a chance to not understand? And tell me what you're doing here. And she looked at me and she said, now she's really looking sad. She said, I'm up here trying to figure out what to do with the rest of my life. And I'm thinking to myself, why did I ask that question? 
And I said, well, what happened? And she looked right at me and she said, I just graduated from college. She said, I have no idea what I am going to do next. And worse than that, she said, I have no idea how to figure it out. She said, my parents just spent all this money. I spent all this time. Here I am. I got my degree. I hung it on the wall. And I have no idea what I'm supposed to do. And now she's full-blown crying. So you know what I did? Got up and left. I told you I didn't have that compassion. <laughs> I went down to my motel room and grabbed a calculator. And I started punching the buttons because I had heard it too many times now. I wanted to know how many hours these young people were spending in a classroom for 80% of them to walk out at the end of that and say, I don't know, I don't know, and be in that condition. So I did. I punched it up. Between first grade and graduating from college, how many hours do you think they spend in a classroom? Almost 25,000 hours. Almost 25,000 hours. As hard as educators work, as important as that process is, after 25,000 hours, 80% of the kids out there who are soon to graduate will tell you that they have no idea what they want to do and don't know how to figure it out. And in this economy, now they're scared to death. So I started thinking, something's not right. I, I think we educate young people very well. I think I got a great education in a public school in Louisiana through 12th grade. I think I got a, in fact, I went down to speak at my old high school last spring. First time I've been back to my high school in Louisiana since the day I graduated from that high school. 37 years ago. 37 years ago. I walked into the front of the school and I thought, I got there early. I said, I'll go to the auditorium. I'll check it out. Get the mic. See what fine. Took two steps and realized, can't remember where the auditorium is. So I said, no problem. I'll go to the cafeteria, have some juice. Somebody can give me a little tour to the auditorium. And... I couldn't remember where the cafeteria was. I quickly realized the only room I could remember exactly how to get to in the entire school was the principal's office. And so I went there and I walked in, I met the principal, his name is Dr. L. And I said to him, I said, I'm so happy to be here. He said, well, we're happy to have you here. I said, yeah, I'm going to speak to all the students. He said, you have the whole school. I said, that's great. I said, I don't know if you know it or not. I said, but I grew up here, right here in this town. He said, well, I knew that, Chad. And I said, I went to this high school. He said, I knew that. I said, well, you weren't the principal then. He said, thank God. <laughs> and I said, but I want to tell you something, Dr. L. I got a fabulous education from this school. And he puffed up and he said, well, that's great. And then I looked right back at him and I said, but this school did absolutely nothing to prepare me for my inevitable destination which was the world of work. And so as I sat up on that mountain in Utah, I started thinking, what do young people need in order to be successful in their inevitable destination? Not successful at their next school, and not successful only at the next level of education, but in the ultimate destination, the world of work, where 99.9% .9 of them are going to go, and to those who don't go, most of them end up in a place they don't want to be. And I concluded that they need three things. I concluded they need knowledge, very important, absolutely essential. You heard me today. I tell the students, you must have knowledge, you must have knowledge, you must have knowledge. But if I was really honest with them and had time, I would look at them and I would say, but the knowledge we ask you to learn must be relevant. Because if we keep asking you, students, to learn stuff that you know you don't need to know, when that day comes that we ask you to learn something that you do need to know, you're not going to be with us, either figuratively or literally. You're going to be gone. And I run around the country preaching this all the time. And two weeks ago, my 10-year-old walks into the house with his homework for the week and his number one homework project, and he goes to a really good public school. His number one homework project was to memorize the preamble to the Constitution. And he spent, I'll bet you, two and a half hours that week memorizing the entire preamble to the Constitution. And then he went into class and he had to recite it times 24 because 24 students had to do it. So 24 students studied between two and two and a half hours. 24 students took the time to recite this in class after they memorized it. And one week later, my straight A 10-year-old can't remember the preamble to the Constitution. What did we accomplish? Somebody. Please, somebody tell me. 
What did we accomplish? Uh, no, seriously. Uh, you, you, you can disagree with me if you want. I don't. It's fine. What did we accomplish? Nothing. You're saying nothing? I'm sorry? I got a belt for that at home, man. What did they learn? How much, how much, how much time is okay to ask a 10-year-old to memorize something that he knows he doesn't need to know, that we know he doesn't need to know, that after he regurgitates it, he already knows he's going to forget it, Anybody in this room can recite the preamble of the Constitution? <laughs> what? The first sentence <laughs> of something. Yeah, I'm with you. I got the whole winning the course thing. Right. You can do the whole thing. What? You can leave now. <laughs> Why do you know that? I don't know. I, I remember everything from 1985. I had to memorize everything. <laughs> I can tell you my whole list of linking and being verbs. And is our list of being verbs? Huh? Mu uh, multiplication facts. That's what else they're working on now. Yeah, but you have, you use them. You. You're always multiplying stuff. I'm always subtracting. <laughs> What do you do? What do you do? Uh, you just blew it. Did you hear what she said? I have never had to use it until just now. Come on. Certainly you couldn't do your current job without that knowledge. Huh? Come on. <laughs> she says I teach music to preschoolers. Okay, we're coming back to that. Don't leave. Look at this. For every 100 students who enter the ninth grade, this is a national st statistic. Yours, I'm sure, could be a little better or worse. 67 graduate from high school. At that point, how many are out on the street? 33 out of 100. Out of that 100. But that's a national statistic. So percentage-wise, what percentage of kids who entered ninth grade are on the street before they finish high school? 33%. How many is that? A million. Almost a million. Before they finish high school, they're on the street. What are they doing on the street? You think they're getting in trouble? Mm-hmm. No, 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 no. I'm not suggesting they're all in prison. No. I live in a state that releases more state prisoners per capita than any state in America, Georgia. Um, no, they don't all go to prison. They, 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 in fact, let's just forget that very small percentage that go to prison. What do the rest of them do? A lot of them go where? To work. Do they not? They go to work, right? Okay. They did before, before the crash, right? How many people are out of work right now in this country? How many? How many people? 
number, though? I mean, is that, oh, you don't know? 15 million. 15 million. Okay. 35 of those who go on to some college or university, okay, 12 of those leave after one year. That leaves 23 in college. College, university, two year, four year. They're, they're in a classroom somewhere. At the end of the day, but 18, 15 to 18, actually graduate with a two or four year degree. Let's call it 15. Where are the other 85? What are they doing? They go where? They go to work. Go to work. God forbid they go to McDonald's and flip burgers, huh? How many times have you heard that? You better get a good education because if you don't, you're going to end up flipping what? Burgers. Uh, you know I built 3,000 playgrounds for McDonald's, so I have been in a few McDonald's. The vast majority of people who own McDonald's franchises, the majority, started out flipping burgers. How about that? Surprise you? Okay, so now we know who we're dealing with. Now, oh, wait, what about, what about the ones that graduate? Where do they go after they graduate? They go to work. Where are they all going to go? All these students you work with, they're all going where? To work. To work. So I'm thinking to myself, sitting on a bench in Utah, I got a great education. I think that was fantastic. But nothing I learned in school has helped me in business at all. Zero. It didn't even relate. It didn't apply. And you can tell me, well, it was good to learn how to, you know, get an assignment and complete an assignment. I, yeah. Yeah, I agree. But there are a lot of ways you can learn that that apply. That something she learned, right? She learned that preamble she, because she recited it. You heard her, right? You still know it or did you forget it? No. Okay. She learned it. She learned it. Right. None of us learned it. We memorized it. We all had to do that project. And 90-something percent of us forgot it. Come back. Half of them are in the workforce. Okay? How about that? So that unemployment pool is not full of high school dropouts. Is that alarming? What, what? Tell me why that's happening. Can't get a job that will enable them to afford Right. Yeah. With the debt that they have when they come out. So they go back to their parents' basements. Right? 84%. What is your answer? What do you think? What do you think? Elementary school. Anybody disagree with that? Come on, it's elementary school. They're supposed to have fun there. I mean, come on. Don't get so heavy. Oh, come on. They just want to play. Can't they just do it in high school? I'd say I'd say he's right. Right there, right there in elementary school. Right there. Okay, so we need knowledge. We all agree? Yeah. We do need knowledge. What knowledge do we need? We we can't we can't teach all the knowledge. 
It's impossible. It's impossible. There's too much knowledge. You, you, teachers teach seven hours a day, X days a year. You can't teach all the knowledge. Which knowledge? That is the fundamental question. If we're going to include knowledge in the, in the mix, in the recipe, which knowledge should be there? That knowledge? You don't think so? But, we, but, 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 but which knowledge? We agreed that knowledge was important. What knowledge is important? I'm, a, I'm asking you. Give me an example of some essential knowledge that you will need to be successful. That's not knowledge. Those are skills. You are giving my speech for me. You need to travel with me. I love you. <laughs> Give me knowledge. No, I want it. Basic English grammar. The ability to write. But, but the ability to write, is that what you're saying? The ability to write? That would be a skill set. Anybody, give me essential knowledge that you must have to succeed. <laughs> math? Math? Yeah. Working a math problem? Balancing a checkbook? Not antagonizing. <laughs> <laughs> knowing something, it's working. Knowing something is based on wrapping all those skills in. So you don't learn knowledge. It's knowledge is just it's knowledge and understanding. How many of you have ever watched Jeopardy? What is that? That's knowledge. That's knowledge. Give me You're going to go do what? <laughs> if I'm interested in learning something, I'm going to go and seek it. I'm going to go and seek that. Seek, like look for. Look for right. Like investigate. Right. Like research. So what is all that, ladies and gentlemen? Researching, seeking, looking for. What is that? That's a what? That's a skill. Of course, that's a skill. I'm, I'm not saying knowledge isn't important. Oh, okay. I'm asking you. I, I'm asking you in the vastness of all the knowledge that's out there, what knowledge should we be teaching young people? Like? How about history? No, nobody said history. Nobody said science. <laughs> Nobody said geography. Nobody said political science. Not, nobody in this room said anything about those. That, that's all, right? Well, no, no, I'm not saying you don't do it. I'm asking you to, if you think that's important. Because that's knowledge. You know, is it relevant? Some of it is. I agree. I'm not saying knowledge isn't relevant. I'm trying to figure out on this plate that teachers have that's full already, how much of it should be knowledge. And then once we figure out how much of it, what should the knowledge be? How many of you have a smartphone or an iPad with you? All right. Go ahead and turn them on. Turn them on, if you will. Let me know if internet is a problem in here. Yeah, iPad's fine. It's great. Everybody doesn't have to have it. You'll see. All right. I'm going to give you two minutes to answer the next three questions. You may use your iPad or smartphone, talk to each other, whatever would be helpful. Okay? We're talking about knowledge here. Ready?
All right, go. How are we doing? You got one minute left. No, I mean the square root of pi is an estimation, but there's an estimation you can find that's very close. It's just a matter of how many decimals out you want to carry it, but I mean it's, in, it, it's infinite, right? I mean it, you would never, yeah. But there's an answer to the question with, with numbers, yeah. Right. <laughs> all right, who's got them all? Raise your hand if you have them all. Who has the first one? Who has the square root of pi? What is it? 7.77245. Yep. Something like that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. The correct answer is the square root of pi. Right. Um, but for the, for the purposes of putting a something down number, that is as close as we're going to get, right? With more numbers if you need it. Okay, so that's good. Number very well. That, that took a minute and a half. Now, what about number two? Wright brothers made their inaugural flight in 1903. Now, did you know that already? You knew that. <laughs> we'll get him. Don't worry. Um, you you knew that because why? Why? Yeah. Probably because I've heard it a lot and read about it and seen it on the History Channel. And my father was six years old when that happened. That's why I knew the answer, because I had heard about it and I watched it on the History Channel, quite frankly. And I was up at the museum in D.C. and saw it. And so that's why I knew it. Um, but the truth of the matter is, I'm just going to guess, that you knew it a long time before that. Because in fourth grade, they teach that to all of us they taught that and how many people knew the answer to that before I let you see your smartphones you knew it you knew it okay all right what about number three who's got that one nobody got are you still working on it nobody got it The Battle of Mount Roaring? That's really good, because there was no such battle. I made that up. And here's why. How many of you sitting in this room today, work with me, <laughs> to do your job effectively, need to know off the top of your head, without a smartphone, what the square root of pi is. How many of you in this room today, sorry, need to know what year Wilbur and Orville Wright flew their first flight? To do your job. Number three is moot point. So just a couple more bits of knowledge, right? But all of you, I can guarantee you, I'm sure, I have no doubt in my mind that if I said to you, what part of the cell provides the energy and I said, just raise your hand if you know the answer. I am sure that everybody will raise their hand because that's a science fact knowledge that every one of us was taught in school. So now, how many people can tell me what part of the cell provides the energy? Raise your hand. Uh, what happened to the rest of us? What happened? Don't need it. So we didn't remember it. 
how much time do you think you spent in a classroom being taught all those things that you don't need so you memorize and regurgitate and you don't use for a test. For a test. Right. Now, and, and I'm glad you said that because, again, I'm not saying you don't need this knowledge. I firmly believe in knowledge. You heard me today. I profess to think it's critically important. But the question is, what knowledge is important today? There's no way it's the same stack that it was when you and I were in fourth grade. There's no way. And if you had a job, Every one of you had a job where you needed to know both one and two and mitochondria. If you had a job where you had to know that to do your job effectively and you arrived at work and you didn't know it, you're fine, right? Because you can spell what? Google. You're fine. You're fine. You're not at risk. So. It brings us full circle to what knowledge is necessary. Well, I don't know the answer to that. I'm not professing to know the answer to that. All I'm saying is I don't care what it is that you need to have knowledge based in your mind right now. It doesn't make any difference as long as you know how to access that knowledge. Because if you can access the knowledge, you're done. It's there. Right on. Okay? That's not the problem. The problem is if we flip the coin and we throw a new word up on the board, and we start saying, okay, you've talked about the knowledge and we kind of thought maybe we needed some, but nobody could commit to what they really thought we needed and it, it, we didn't get there. No, I still don't know what knowledge is important. But if we flip the coin and we jump the skills and I said to you, what skills must your students have in order to succeed in the real world of work, the inevitable destination? I'm jumping them right out of the classroom. There are skills they need in the classroom too. I know that for sure. But once they get to that inevitable destination, tell me, what skills must they have? Fire away. I got a whole page here to write on. Thinking. Can we say problem solving? Can we say critical thinking? Okay. This is even more in depth. What else? No, 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 no. I love that one. In fact, it's not under anything. Okay. What else? What is it? Why would you put that on here? And why have we already gone through 10 before you said that? <laughs> hey, when I was in high school, I told you I went to a great high school. Nobody ever taught me a single thing about computers. Why not? I just want to stand right here, sir, in front of you and thank you from the bottom of my heart for your answer because I have asked that same question to about 50,000 educators and every single time I ask that I say why not why didn't they teach me about computers every single time I ask that question at least five people in the audience say they didn't have them back then and I just want to tell you how much I appreciate your answer which was well it wasn't relevant then I appreciate that <laughs> you better believe computer skills Technology skills. Right. What else? Employability skills. That's kind of a broad, that's kind of what we're talking about. That could be our title. But what are they? Writing. Okay. I'm gonna, and that writing is going to fall under kind of a business writing. Communicate. I got, sorry? Well, I, Interpert is right, but I think that's going to take place with people's skills and communicate. Okay. What else? Okay. 
Interviewing skills, excuse me. Uh, but, 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 but why do I need that? I mean, I'm, you know, I'm 16, but, but why do I need the interview skills? I'm, a, I'm just going to email. I'm just going to text them. Hmm? Oh, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just do it online. Huh? Face to who? <laughs> I'm 16, man. <laughs> I, you know, I could... I'll, sky, I'll Skype. I'll Skype. But, You're right. And usually that phone call will determine whether or not you get that face-to-face -face in some cases. So You're right. That's a, yeah. What else? Work ethic. Work ethic. Great one. What else? Say that one again. Quantitative literacy. Quantitative literacy. Can we call it financial literacy? Well, is that okay? Financial literacy? Sales? Sales? Yeah. I'll put I'll put selling on here. And yourself is included every time you turn around. Okay? What else? Was anybody late today? Everybody get here on time? Thank you. Okay. Anybody know somebody that helped them professionally at some point in your life ever? Anybody know somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody else who could help you? Yep, networking skills. Thank you. Oh, organizational. Right. Confidence. What do you think? Is that a skill? I've, I've always struggled with that one. I, I don't really self-esteem, confidence, security. Learn. Well, I, but but is it a learn. well? But skills are learned. Yeah, well. But so is 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 confidence a skill? I know, but so it, but we ca would we categorize it as a skill? No. What would it be? Confidence, self-esteem. Well, you got to be confident to be a drug dealer too. I mean, it's. <laughs> I mean, I think confidence is important. I did, I'm, and I'm not doubting. I, I don't know. To me, it doesn't. It's not knowledge or no, and it's not a skill. But is it? It's not a skill, is it? I don't know. Well, we can come back to it. Okay. Anything else? Weeding. How did we miss reading? Huh? How did we miss reading? My goodness, a school board member told me last couple years ago, he said, I can fix all the problems in schools. I said, as at lunch, I said, how, how are you going to do that? He said, I'm going to make every fifth grader read every one of the classics. And I said, you are going to double the fifth grade dropout rate in an hour. Anyway, okay, what else? Good list. Really good list. Hello. <laughs> Listening skills. Mm, yeah, speaking as in. Mm -mm. Let's give public speaking its own. 
And, and right under listening, what's the other skill? What's the other skill? What is the other skill? I am asking you a question. Questioning skills. All right. You guys are nailing them. Great. Okay. Now, just looking at our list, and I know you can't probably read it in the back. Thinking, writing, problem solving, people skills, critical thinking, communication, knowledge, accessing knowledge, computer technology skills, interviewing skills, public speaking skills, work ethic, financial literacy, selling, time management, networking, uh, organizational skills, reading, listening, and questioning. How many of you have a job today that requires at least most of these skills? Raise your hand, please. Hi. I want to be sure we're, we're, we're where I think we are. We're at 100%. Did you raise? Okay. We're at 100%. You said it. We're at 100%. Now, here's the coin flip. What happens to you if you arrive at work on your first day on the job and you don't have any of these skills? How long do you last? I agree, you wouldn't have gotten the job, but if you did. Well, that's, that, that's like um, Catch Me If You Can. Did you see that movie? Um, the, he, the, this is a, a kid, like an 18 year old, who faked being a doctor, an airplane, airplane pilot, etc. It's a true story. And you know he faked being the airplane pilot. He got the he got the airplane pilot's uniform and the badge and the whole thing, the whole thing. And, and then he got in the airplane. And then the the pilot asked him to fly the airplane. So you're in trouble if you don't have these skills. We agree. Now, here's the bottom line of all of this: if you get to work and you have a job that needs these skills, and you told me it's 100 percent, and you don't have the skills, you're done. You're fried for one major reason. You cannot Google these skills like you can Google knowledge. See? These are skills they must be learned and they only improve if they are practiced. I hate to simplify it, but how many of you can ride a bike? Raise your hand. Ride a bike. Could you ride a bike when you were one? And then when you got a little older, you finally tried, you got on that tricycle thing, right? And then eventually those wheels came off and you got on the next bike and you tried this skill you had. And the first time you tried to ride, what happened? Fell on your butt, right? It, it, yeah, everybody. And so you got up and if, if you were brave and didn't get hurt too bad, you tried again, you rode, and what happened? Fell again, right? Fell a few times. Until one day after you had practiced and practiced and practiced, what you had learned and learned, you got on the bike and you started riding, and son of a gun, it stayed upright. And you start riding down the sidewalk or the road, and your mother, father, run alongside of you. They weren't touching you because then it wouldn't be your deal. And they're right next to you, and they're so excited, and you're going, and you're going, and you're going. And then you realize you learned how to ride the bike. You practiced riding the bike, but you never learned how to stop the bike. And so you fell again, right? until you learned how to stop the bike and practice that skill. And before you know you can ride the bike. How many of you can ride a bike today? Not well, but, right? If you learned it, you practice it, you got good at it, you can do it. You learn to swim, you practice, you get good at it, you can do it. You learn to throw a baseball, you get good at it, you do it. Shoot a basketball, play a piano, I don't care what the skill is. Communicate, network, organize, manage time technology. If you learn it and you practice, you get better. And then 20 years later, when you're in some workshop with a bozo like me who says to you, huh, okay, I got three questions. Can you ride a bike? And I have a bike. You say, sure, you get on the bike and you ride it. You don't stand here and say, well, no, I, 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 yeah, I know that pi, square root. Uh, ye what year did they buy those planes? What? You don't say that because, you see, that's knowledge that you memorized, regurgitated, and forgot. These are skills. That once you have them, you have them, and you practice and you improve, they're yours, and you own them. So we've all agreed, students must have these skills in order to succeed. 
We have agreed they must learn them in order to have them, and we have agreed that they're only going to improve if they practice. So the question is simple. Here's the plate. The students come into the schools by the millions. We have this plate. We have limited time to teach. We have limited years to get it done. What should be on the plate? What percent of it should be stacked up with skill, education, or as I call it, preparation? And what percent of it should be knowledge? And how do we make that mix work for all students? I don't know the answer to that question. All I know is they're all going to work. They all need these skills. And the biggest point of the day is, see these skills? You didn't learn them in school. I didn't learn them in school. For the most part, we learned them where? Home. We learned them at home. Students are not learning them at home anymore. Now, do I think that's right? No. Do I think you should have to take that on? No. But if you really want to get them ready and fully prepared and not just be educated, then we have to. We have to. We have to take it on. We have to add it to the mix. Let's look at them. <clears throat> I put an asterisk by communication. Because I think communication is the number one foundational skill upon which many of these others can be built. Certainly reading is right in there as well. But upon which they build, I think communication. So we're talking about asking kids to communicate with people. In some cases, people they don't know. And I told a story this morning you heard about the strangers and all that. And, and it's very true. Uh, you know, I have an 8-year-old, 10-year-old. I understand the whole stranger danger thing. But at some point, those young people need to learn to walk up to a total stranger and have a conversation. Why can't they do that? There are 16-year-olds who can't do that. There are 18-year-olds who can't do that. Why not? Number one, I think, true, partially because their whole life they've been told, don't talk to strangers. I agree. I do too. I do too. What are you going to do about that? No, no, no. But what if we took the same amount of time, you're making my point for me, I love you. What if we took the same amount of time and we pulled out the preamble and we shoved in people skills? Something we know he's going to need. And, and, and the bigger picture is something that he believes he's going to need. Because that, I think, is one of our biggest challenges today is these young people, I mean, there's a reason why 33% of them disappear. You know, and there, and there are lots of reasons, but in some cases, in many cases, they just don't see the relevance. So it's the time spent. It's the plate that's full. What needs to be on it? I mean, I, my best friend two years ago was the National Principal of the Year. All country, whole country, National Principal of the Year. I had breakfast with him yesterday, and I was asking him about this in the preamble, and he's a big history buff, and I mean, and he looked at me and he said, it's not that it's not important, it's that in today's world, there's something more important that should be taught. Using that amount of time, for the reason of it's relevant and applies, but as much for the reason that the student needs to see it as, yeah, I get it, I get it. Now, they're going to love everything, look, I know that. But in general, because that transfers right to, look, I kind of like school. Let me tell you what we did today, Dad. Look, I built a solar system model with my 10-year-old two weeks ago. Most fun I've had in two years, school-wise, with him. He had a blast. Built it, knew it, owned it, could tell me which planet goes where, how big they were, what grows on what planet, is there water. Unbelievable. That's all knowledge. It's all knowledge. We did it by building a model. Okay, so communication. They've been said, 
taught not to talk to strangers. They didn't learn it at home. In order to have a conversation with anybody, anybody, young people have to understand they only need to do two things. Number one, ask simple questions. Too many young people think they have to have some very complicated, complex questions, all lined up, ready to talk to a stranger, particularly an adult. When in fact, all they have to do is ask simple questions, number one, and listen to the answer they get to that question to come up with their idea for the next question. Fair enough? Have we ever met before? What is your name? Rose? Where are you from? Originally. Originally. Chicago area, and how long did you live in the Chicago area? 24 years, and then you moved where? Ohio. Ohio. Where were you in Ohio? Bowling Green. Bowling Green. How long did you spend in, Ohio, in Bowling Green? Two years. Two years, and then where did you go? Back to Chicago. Back to Chicago. And you stayed how long that time? One. One. Year. How long have you been living here in this area? And uh, are you married? I'm widowed. You're widowed. Do you have any children? Two. How old are your children? They're 30. Where do they live? And what do they do? And do they have any children? <laughs> and what are their favorite places to vacation? And how long could we talk? Well, I would have to do some talking back. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Out there, it's true. Both people would do it, which is even better because it gives me a little more time to take it in and think and get... But the truth is, I could talk, we could talk forever, couldn't we? Because all I'm doing is asking simple questions, listening to her answer. And I know that sounds elementary to you, but 80% of your students can't do it. 80, what? Yeah, can't do it. Yeah, well, yeah, and, we, yeah, and that, that is another issue here, for sure. And to your point, they can't text their job interview, right? So... Simple questions, and I listened to her answer. That's all I did, and we could talk forever. And, and then I would introduce to the young people, after you understand, you just ask simple questions, you listen to the answer to get your idea for the next question, then you stick to three subjects. What do you think they are? Wait a minute, first of all, what do people like to talk about? Themselves, okay. And in talking about them, themselves, what three categories do you think? Family, jobs, Hobbies. Family jobs, hobbies. Family jobs, hobbies. Family jobs, hobbies. If you remember nothing else today, <laughs> teach them. Family jobs, hobbies. Those are the subjects. Simple questions. Listen to the answer. You will develop communicators. Uh, no, you're, 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 do you have two daughters? Ma'am, do you have two daughters? Two daughters, okay. Because I have two sons and I have the identical situation. Family jobs, hobbies. Listen. Get your idea. Simple. Great. If they do that, they're all going to get better. Your two daughters are not going to get even. They're not. They're starting here, right? This one, this one won't talk to anybody, right? And this one will talk to a wall, right? They both get better. They both get better. They both get better. That's our goal, that they get better. Our goal is not that they get even. That's not what's going to happen. All right? My two boys are never going to get even. That's not the purpose, the goal, the intent. The intent is that they get better. So your, your daughter, who's an introvert, shy, gets better. Maybe never passed here better, but better. And, and your daughter, who lets it rip, she gets better. Better, okay? Because she has a skill that she can practice and improve. The basic art of conversation, which once you can do that, leads you into the next skill, which is networking, which is the ability to meet someone that you don't know, get to know them by talking to them and communicating with them and listening to them and asking questions of them. That was five skills right there in that two sentences. Okay? And then staying in touch with them. Right? What happened to... I'll pick on him. You're fine. When you were younger and you met somebody and you wanted to stay in touch with them, what did you have to do? You get their phone number and call them. Address and do what with that address? Do what? With a, like a utensil? <laughs> on on like, a, what, like a piece of paper? And then do what? Make an airplane out of it? No, serious. 
so you had to fold it and put it in the envelope, which you had to buy? And then what would you have to do the envelope? Lick it, right? Close it, and then the stamp. And when you were young and I was young, what would you have to do the stamp? Lick it. They didn't have the self adhesives then, right? So, so now you're a piece of paper, an envelope, a full two licks, and, you know, 18 cents, right? And four days. And they got your message, right? Now ah, you stay in touch with them. Now, today, in your opinions, is there any excuse for a young person not to be able to network in a professional sense? They don't need the envelope. They don't need the stamp. They don't need the tongue. They don't need the money. They need nothing. All they have to do is stay in touch. Stay in touch. But you know what? It's a skill because it doesn't include professionally nine letter words that are reduced to one letter. It doesn't. It doesn't include all lowercase letters. It doesn't include absolutely no punctuation at the end of a sentence. It doesn't include all that. It can still be done the same way with thumbs, but it has to be professional. So they already know how to network. They are the masters, the magicians at networking. We simply need to teach them how to transfer that skill into a professional setting, and they're off and running in networking. There's no excuse that they wouldn't have great networking skills once they see the value of that. Once they understand that if I meet you, get to know you, get along, and then you, you might be able to help me someday. When I'm come, or, amazing, I might be able to help you. Can you imagine? I went to give the commencement address at a university in South Dakota five years ago, and I, I went up to Rapid City, flew in, got there next morning, drove to the facility, Great Big Civic Center, and I'm down in the basement where everybody's getting ready. Well, as you know, I've never been to a college graduation, okay? So I don't really understand everything, and I go down there, and they tell me if you're going to give the commencement address, you have to wear the, the gown. Fine. So they give me the gown. I'm down there. I'm trying to get the gown on. I cannot find the pockets. I know they're there somewhere. And I'm all twisted up. And all of a sudden, somebody right next to me, a gentleman, says, do you need some help? And I looked up and I said, yeah. I realized the guy asking me if I needed help getting on the gown was the president of the university. So he got me straightened up. And I, got, and I looked at him and I said, uh, Dr. Johnson, I, thank you, first of all. Secondly, I, I have to ask a question. I said, um, have we ever met? He said, no. I said, I didn't think so. I said, but have we emailed? He said, nope. I said, did my office send a DVD to you so you see me speak? And he said, I've never seen you speak, Chad. And I said, well, I'm going to go way out of line here and ask you this question. Why in the world did you hire me to speak to those 2,000 people out there? He said, it was easy. I said, really? He said, yes. He said, in South Dakota, every summer we have something one week in the summer, it's a business camp for kids. It's called Youth Business Adventures. And I interrupted him and I said, Youth Business Adventures? I know that camp. I speak there every summer in June. I've done it for five years in a row. He said, I know. He said, last summer, our 16-year-old daughter attended the camp. She was there for an entire week. She finished the week camp. She came home. She ran into our house, ran right by her mother without saying hello, came right to me and said, Daddy, we had a speaker at our camp this week that you need to hire. And so I did. You see, that 16-year-old got that job for me. So sometimes it's a younger person helping an older person. It's a two-way street, okay? Networking skills. No young person today is going to make it without help. 15 million people out of work. Probably 13 million of them have experience. Probably five, eight million of them are really good at doing something. That's the competition for the student who's coming out of college with no experience, no work resume, no contacts, right? That's who they're competing against. It's even tougher. So networking skills, people skills. You heard me today. To me, people skills are the most important skill you can have. Absolutely. I mean, you, 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 know, you heard the iced tea lady story? That, that's not uncommon. I mean, everybody, well, how many of you have ever had to work with a jerk? Just raise your hand. 
if, you, if you've ever had to work with a jerk, raise your hand, ever. Don't, don't look left or right. You, all you do is you raise your hand. Okay, they're everywhere. And, and it's not just the ability to deal with them, it's being prepared to deal with them before you need to deal with them, you see? It's not, let's learn it on the job. Let's learn it after the fact. That, that, that's not what we're talking about, okay? What we're talking about is, you walk into a situation, your students do, and all of a sudden, bam, they need people skills. They can't Google it. They need people skills right there. I wrote a story in my last book, the career readiness book. I told you we built the playgrounds for McDonald's, thousands and thousands of them. McDonald's had a guy up in Chicago at their corporate headquarters by the name of Pat Hines, who was in charge of all new construction projects. And so Pat Hines, from the day I met him, at 20, I was 27 years old, never liked me. He thought I was too young, didn't have any business, didn't like me at all. And so as we got busier and busier building these playgrounds, for franchisees all over the country, after he told me not to do that because he wanted to watch our product for two years to see if it really held up, he wouldn't let me do any of the company stores, the ones owned by the corporation, but I could do the franchise. So I did the franchise and I had done 2,000 of them. In the midst of all that, once a month he'd have his assistant call me Tuesday afternoon, five o'clock and say, Mr. Hines needs you in Chicago tomorrow morning for a meeting. I would have to shut everything down, buy the most expensive plane ticket there was, go to Chicago, get a car service, go to the Oak Brook, Illinois corporate office. I'd walk into a conference room with a table this size. Mr. Hines and his five or six little people would sit down. They'd beat up on me for about 30 minutes. They'd get up and they'd leave. I'd go home. The next month, same thing. And this went on year after year. So finally, one day, assistant called me. Need you tomorrow? Fine. I flew into Chicago, took the car service. I walked into the conference room 10 minutes early. Great big conference table. I sat at the end of the table because I knew he was going to sit at the other end. I used to call him Pat the Rat. And so he's over there, not to his face. And so he's, a, the doors open and in come Pat the Rat and his six people. And they sit all around the conference room. And I'm sitting here. Nobody says hello. Nobody says anything. He looks over at me and he says, I've been doing some research. He's got this folder in his hand. And he said, you are providing that rubber surface for us on our playgrounds all over the world. He said, that rubber surface is made from polyurethane binder and recycled tire rubber that comes from Columbus, Ohio. He said, I know now how much the binder costs. And I know exactly how much that recycled rubber costs. And we have very accurate calculations on your labor costs. He said, you're charging us $22 a square foot to install that surface on our playgrounds. And then he looked at me and I quote, he said, you are raping us. And he put the folder down. And I looked across the table and I said, Mr. Hines, with all due respect, I said, I live in Atlanta, Georgia, as you know. And I said, and as you also know, Atlanta is the home of Coca-Cola the greatest soft drink in the world. And I said, you serve it at every one of your restaurants in the whole world, you serve Coke. I said, and since I live in Atlanta, it only stands to reason that I probably would know some people who work at Coke. And I said, since I do know people who work at Coke, I know how much the syrup costs, and I know how much a large cup costs, and you sell a large Coke in your stores for $1.17. I said, now you tell me, Mr. Hines, who is raping whom? And not a word was said. He stood up, his six people stood up, they walked out of the room, closed the door. As soon as the door closed, I jumped up in the air and went, yes! I never felt better in my life. I thought I just conquered the biggest giant you've ever seen in your life. And I sat there for a little while. I got on the plane. I called all my friends. I told my partners. I just told everybody what I had done, how great it was. Three weeks later, Mr. Hines went to California, paid off one of our guys, got the formula from him, set up another company in California to compete against us, and gave them 200 projects to start off their business at $10,000 a piece. 
The title of my book chapter is The Two Million Dollar Big Mouth. Because had I kept my mouth shut, that never would have happened. Not only did we lose two million dollars, but within two years, we got out of the business because he had created so much competition that the prices were driven down and wasn't worth it anymore. All because I was too stupid to know that I needed to keep my mouth shut and not to burn that bridge. I needed those people skills before I walked into his office, into the conference room, not after. So students need them now, not later. Okay? All right. Um, we're going to take a break. Is that what you're telling me? Yeah. Okay. Change the tape. Okay. All right. Is everybody back? Are we missing anyone? Oh, you think we're here? Close enough? Okay. All right. Let's let's in the midst of all these skills we're working on, we'll um, take a little squi uh, skill quiz. I need I need a volunteer. Volun volun volunteer here here. Yeah, if you're gonna volunteer, no. you don't have to. Somebody else want to volunteer? This is painless. This is so easy. This table in the back is way too quiet. I'll go. Oh, he just saved you. <laughs> Are you on their payroll or something? No, no. I just, huh? I just, is your boss at that table? No, she's not. Okay. All right. <laughs> All right. He, now, tell me your name. Brandon. Andy? Brandon. Brandon? Yes. Pleasure. Brandon is going to need some help. Okay. So get ready back there. All right. Following slide will list one skill. You have two minutes to learn the skill. Everybody get your smartphones out. You may use your smartphone or iPad to do so. Got my volunteer, Mr. Brandon here. Skill is? Piece of cake, huh? That's not the skill. <laughs> you are floating over here. I got this guy. Okay. They couldn't have helped you with that either, though. Don't worry. All right, ready? That was too easy. A little bit different look on your face now, Brian. A little bit. The skill of keeping two or more objects in the air at one time by alternately tossing and catching them. Okay? That is the skill. All right? Now. <laughs> you have two minutes to learn the skill. Right now, you don't have to do anything. They're going to teach you the skill. Go ahead. Use your smartphones, your iPads, and in two minutes, you need to have Brandon ready to go. <laughs> Whatever you want to do, I'll give you two minutes. You can start telling him what he needs to know how to do. Oh, oh, you need an object. Oh, oh, wait. He needs an object. Did anybody bring an object? Yeah. 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 Well, actually, Brandon, the good news is I brought objects. Oh, boy. I brought objects. So, <coughs> are you ready? Yeah. This happened to be in my bag this morning. Huh? Juggling prop. Imagine it was just right there, right there. Very careful. I will. Juggle three eggs for 15 seconds without dropping any eggs. Hint. There you are. All right. The 
Okay, well, two minutes is almost up. All of your help is getting ready to be here. Are we almost ready to help you? Smart. Good eye and hand coordination. Uh, Hand-eye coordination, she says. Step one, hold a ball in your right hand. Okay, it will be an egg in this case. What I'm here to tell you, Brandon, is that if you can't juggle in the next three minutes, you're losing your job. Oh, man. Well, yeah, I mean, they've got smartphones and iPads. Certainly we can do this, right? Yeah, sure we can. Anybody else have any suggestions? Your two minutes is up. <laughs> Come on, did you Google it? Wait, what are you telling me? You can't Google a skill? You guys were great on the square root of pi and uh, Orville and Will, but right. Learn by doing. Learn by doing, yeah. she says. Uh, all right, I guess that's all the help you're going to get. Are you ready? No, but I'll three, anyway. three eggs for 15 seconds without dropping any. Uh, right, uh huh. Oh, you can go anytime you want. Oh, you mean juggle? Yeah. I thought you meant when you wanted to just go. Oh, I can go? <laughs> no, no, come juggle. Maybe I should put a tarp down. Okay, here we go. Ready? The skill that we Googled. Starring Brandon. Yay. Any day now. Right. Oh! <laughs> well, that was one second, right? The good news is they were all hard boiled, Brandon. Well, uh, enjoy your lunch and thank you so much for, for helping us. No problem. Kind of hard to go. Yeah. Kind of hard to Google skills. When do the kids need to learn these skills? Long time ago, right? And so, if they're in your schools, it's a middle school or a high school. If they don't have all these skills, it's imperative that we catch up. Now, how do you do that with standardized tests? Teach to the test. Teachers evaluated based on grade performance. How do you do that? I live outside of Atlanta. The number one, that is the number one standardized test cheating school in America. I live right there. Superintendent all the way down. Yeah. It's unbelievable the pressure that that is putting on this industry of people who are trying to help kids at, at the expense of kids not getting what they really need. Oh my gosh, how about that? How about that? But you know, you guys up here kind of in that Washington DC area and I saw it's starting to sound like they may be making some progress there too in terms of that whole test situation. Okay, let's go back to our skills. Keep an eye on that. Where were we? <coughs> communication. We have a great activity in communication. Once we teach the young people to ask simple questions, listen to their answer, come up with their next question, and then focus on jobs, families, and hobbies, one of the activities we have them do once they understand how to meet a stranger, we have them come up one at a time in front of the class and play the role of a stranger. So the student would stand in front of the class and the, his or her fellow students would ask the questions. Simple, listen to the answer. This student will answer the question. So what skills are we working on? Student has to come up in front of the class and answer questions for all of his classmates. He is working on his public speaking skills. Very serious misnomer. Public speaking is not just what I do. Speak to a group of people. Public speaking is anytime you speak in public, period. The only thing that's not public speaking is when you talk to yourself. Everything else is public speaking. Because as you, one of you said it, one day your students are going to have to pick up the phone and talk to somebody about trying to get a job interview. Maybe they'll email them a few times, but eventually they're going to have to pick up the phone and talk to them. And that is public speaking. If they go to an interview and there are only two people there interviewing them, or one, that's public speaking. And that's a skill that must be learned and must be practiced in order to improve. So 
public speaking, right here, stand in front of his class. Little Johnny stand in front of 24 of his classmates, that's about as daunting as any kid wants to deal with. So public speaking. The students will ask the questions, so they will be working on their questioning skills. Johnny will be hearing the questions, so he'll be working on his listening skills. And they will be coming up with questions relative to jobs, families, and hobby. Johnny will answer them. We don't want Johnny to be Johnny because if I'm Johnny and you're my classmates and you ask me my name and I say Johnny and you ask me how old I am and I say 15, you're already bored, right? So I'm going to let Johnny create his own identity. I'm going to let Johnny be anyone he wants to be for one minute. Why one minute? That's their attention span. So I got Johnny up here for one minute, creating his own identity. He can be anyone he wants to be. The students will ask him the questions. I've been in a class where we had uh, Shaquille O'Neal. We had, um, who else was in there? Um, uh, blah, 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 blah. Madonna. Uh, we've, we've had some real clowns there only for a minute, thankfully. But it gives the kids a chance to create, critically think, solve a problem, come up with the name of somebody they want to be, and then be that person. and. For the next one minute, that's who they are. They sit down. Another one comes up. For one minute, they sit down. Everybody stays involved because they're moving in and out, in and out, playing the role of a stranger. At the end of that one hour class period, everybody in that class has had a chance to participate, and everyone in that class has a new skill. They're not all here. Some are here, and some are there. But they all have a new skill that they can practice, which is good, because the next time we get together, we're bringing in a school community stranger. This is an adult, so we're taking it up to the next level. Someone they know, kind of, sort of, they've seen around school, but they don't know really well. But it's an adult, so we're taking it really to the next level. The adult stands in front of the class, and they too play the role of a stranger for 10 minutes. And the students start asking their questions, simple, listen, jobs, families, hobbies, and they're asking it now of an adult. And it's not the school counselor. It's the school counselor, but that's not the role they're playing. I watched a lady walk in the other day, school counselor. She stood in front of the class. First kid in the first desk looked at her and said, what's your name? She gave her real name. I'm in the back row thinking, lady, I'm already bored. And the next kid looked at her and said, what do you do? And this lady looked right at him and she said, I run a $250 million corporation. And a little girl in the back row jumped up and said, wait a minute, I thought you were the school counselor. And she looked at her and she said, that's my part-time job. And she went on for 10 minutes about this big CEO job, and when she got finished, those kids didn't know who she was. <laughs> and she walked out the room, and another one came in, 10 more minutes, walked out, another one came in, 10 more minutes. Why do we keep doing this over and over and over? Practice, 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 practice. So now students realize the same process that worked for little Johnny worked for, for, for the counselor, the, the grown-up. Now they have a skill. They can go home, practice it with their parents, their parents' friends, their friends' parents, any adult they meet on the street, their coach, the people they work with. The next time we get together, we bring in a total stranger from the business community, someone they do not know that comes from the business community who makes them the right messenger. You see, you know the messages, I know the messages, but sometimes we're not the right messenger, right? So now we bring this business person in, and he or she stands in front of the class, and they are who they are. And the students go right through it again. Simple questions, listen to the answer, job, family, hobby. Now they're getting the answers from someone out in the business community. All right? All takes place in three hours. They have now developed the art of conversation, the ability to communicate with people from all walks of life who they don't know. And all walks of life, yes, it's important. It's important for these people who come in and speak to the kids to be diverse. I want them to see a cross-section, which is what they're going to see out there when they go to their interview. So they're comfortable with that. Comfortable with that. Okay? Meet a stranger. The next activity we do is the unusual job report. I'm going to let you guys do it with me. We have every student pick up the phone, call someone they don't know who has an unusual job, interview that person for 10 minutes on the phone, hang up the phone and write a one-page written report about the unusual job, come into class and give a one-minute oral report on the unusual job, what skills are we working on there? Kid picks up the phone and talks to a stranger. 
which they can do now. They have a conversation with them, art of conversation. They ask the questions, questioning skills. They have to listen to the answer, listening skills. They've met someone in the business community, networking skills. They hang up the phone, they write them a thank you note, very important skill. They then write their one page written report, writing skills. They come into the class and give a one minute oral report, public speaking skills. And they have shared their knowledge with 25 classmates. At the end of the day, Jimmy, he does a report on wedding photography. People who get paid to take pictures at weddings. And Jimmy does the research, finds the wedding photographer, calls him up, does the interview, writes the report, gives the one minute presentation on wedding photography, and he decides after all of that, he wouldn't be a wedding photographer if it was the last job on earth. You know why? Jimmy doesn't even like to take pictures. Number one. Number two, he found out in his research that you have to travel a fair amount if you're going to be a wedding photographer. But worst of all, he came to the conclusion that most people get married on Saturdays. And Jimmy's not working on weekends. So he hates the job. Hates it, hates it, hates it. Total waste of time, right? Was it? No, because Sarah, who sits in the back row, heard Jimmy talking about the wedding photographer, and she had never heard of such a person, and she loves taking pictures. So she got the wedding photographer's name and email address off the board, which everybody has to put on there, and she emails the wedding photographer and says, Jimmy, my classmate, gave a report on your business, and I'm fascinated. I love that. Is there any way I could come to your office over the Thanksgiving break in the morning, just for a half a day, I don't need to get paid, I don't need to get paid, and see what you do. Why don't I need to get paid? I'll tell you why. Because you see, I'm about to invest 25,000 hours of my life in a classroom, and I'm not getting paid for that. So I can invest three hours at your business relevant to work and my future, I don't need to get paid for that. So I will come to your office if it's okay. Well, sure, of course the wedding photographer is going to say yes. In goes Sarah. She spends the morning there. She loves it, and they love her. So they invite her back. She goes back another couple of days during the Thanksgiving break. They ask her to come back over Christmas, have a couple of projects for her, and they decide they're going to pay her a little bit. So she goes. She loves it, has a blast, meets the people who work there, learns the business. That summer they give her a part-time job. She works all summer at the wedding photographer. She now learns every aspect of the business. Marketing, management, administration, ordering, brides, how to deal with the mother of a bride, all that stuff. All that stuff. And she works there four summers through college, through her college, college career, and when she graduates in photojournalism, Sarah decides she's going to be a wedding photographer. What are her chances of success? <coughs> Average, good, or great? Even better. Why? Because Jimmy gave a report in her freshman high school class on wedding photographers that he hated. And a little light went off in her head. She didn't even realize there was such a thing. And here she goes flying down the road as a wedding photographer. She can either keep working for the wedding photographer that she's worked with for five years, or he or she can refer her to another wedding photographer if they don't have room for her, or she can walk down the road and put up her own shingle and start her own business as a wedding photographer. But she knows the people, she knows the players, she knows the business, she knows everything, the client, the customer, she needs to know. And she learned it working part-time. The unusual job report. When I was 12 years old, I learned how to play tennis. Never played tennis before in my life. Starting the summer of my 13th year, I started working in a little tennis shop in Louisiana. My job was to string the tennis rackets. And I was hired by the guy that owned the shop, Mr. Reagan, who was about 60 years old, 65 at the time. Mr. Reagan, at 13, took me under his wing and taught me everything there was to know about that business. Ordering, marketing, sales, customer service, administration, inventory, Everything there was to know, he taught me every single day. He helped me and taught me and taught me and taught me. 13 years old, every week I worked there after school, five days a week and on Saturday. Every single week. And then in the summers when I was around. 
When I was 16 years old, Mr. Reagan dropped dead on the tennis court from a massive heart attack. He had one daughter who inherited that tennis shop. There was one employee at that tennis shop, a manager by the name of Becky. Mr. Reagan died. His daughter came into the shop to talk to us about the business and said, we're going to sell this business. And then she looked over at Becky and she said, you're the only employer we have. We don't know anything about the business. And Becky said, well, you know, we can keep running it and Chad can work. And so the daughter said, well, okay, we'll try it. And so they kept the business open. They had nothing to do with it, didn't even come in. They knew nothing about it. So Becky ran it every day. The manager, Becky, and I came in after school. And we worked, and we worked, and we worked. Six weeks later, Becky came up with a new marketing strategy. At the beginning of the day, she would come in with her clothes that she had home, came from home, walk into the dressing room with brand new clothes from the store, change into the brand new tennis clothes, put her old clothes into a bag, at the end of the day, she would forget to change back into her old clothes. And she would go home with the new clothes. And two days later, she'd do it again. And then she'd go home with the new clothes. And she'd never bring the new clothes back to the store. And this went on for days and days and days until one day, she forgot her bag of old clothes at the store. And the owner's daughter came in, found it, figured it out, confronted her, she admitted it, and they fired her right there on the spot. So now there's a tennis shop with no manager, an owner who knows nothing about it, and a 16-year-old kid who works part-time. So the owner came to me and said, we probably have to sell the shop. And I said, OK. She said, because we don't know anything about this business. And I said, I do. She said, what do you mean? I said, your father taught me everything there was to know about this business. I know it from start to finish, top to bottom, you name it. I know how to do it now because he taught me. And that lady looked at me and she said, can you teach us? And I said, sure. And when I was 16 years old, that lady paid me the equivalent of one of your students getting paid $40 an hour to teach her what I knew about my part-time job. Now, the point is not that I got paid to do that. The point is that that is the only experience I ever had about business. I've never taken a business class in my life. I've never gone to business school. And the principles that I learned from that guy at age 13, 14, 15, and 16, I have been able to apply to every business I've ever owned since then. And I learned them all as a teenager, which means your students can learn them as a teenager if put in the right environment and thrown with the right people and they want to learn and want to listen and have that desire. So the unusual job report opens the door to students to 25 or 30 unusual jobs. Not only the job, but the people. Because the third ingredient of success after knowledge and skills is people. People make people successful, period. Nobody in this room got where you are today without the help of somebody, somewhere along the line. So that is critically important. That's also why part-time work is so important. Because it's during that experience that young people will learn the work ethic and the things that they need to know. Okay, uh, next, computer skills we talked about. Unfortunately, I didn't get in high school. We don't have to talk about that again. But today, you know it, they can't make it. And the more they know about technology, the better off they are. This is simply a matter of transferring existing skills into a new environment from a social environment into a professional environment. Whether it comes to research, or texting, or social networking, or website evaluation, we simply need to take them and take that piece of their mind and turn it so that they can apply that professionally. That is not rocket science, but it has to be clearly stated. Today we're playing for fun. Tomorrow we're working in technology for real serious business, okay? So that they can do what they need to do. They can come out and bang out PowerPoints and Excel spreadsheets and documents and they know what they're doing when it comes to technology. Much more so than I will ever know in my life, which is one of the challenges today. So many of these younger people know so much more than us, but they have to be able to apply it without question to that. Um, we talked about this interviewing. The 15 million people who are out of work are out there. However, 
every month, three or 400,000 people get a job. So you read the jobs report, right? USA Today did a very interesting article about six months ago on those people who are getting the jobs. Who do you think is getting the jobs? Who are those people? People who what? Who know how to interview and sell themselves? Say that again. Yeah. USA Today article said that 85% of the jobs that are being gotten today are being gotten by someone who knew someone who knew someone who helped them get the job at their company before the rest of the world even knew about the job. If I have 694 friends on Facebook, I should also be able, as I move through high school, start working part-time, find myself in college, I should also have 678 connections on LinkedIn. Right? Okay? It's the same process. It's just a different environment. But if they don't understand that beforehand, They'll be like a lot of my friends. 28 years old, I got 1,600 friends on Facebook. I mean, it's as if they've accomplished some monumental goal in life, and they have no friends, no connections professionally, and they can't find a job. Can't. I mean, I've got the greatest friend in the world who lives in California. That show, The Deadliest Catch, you've seen that? I mean, my, my friend has produced, or, I mean, she's produced all kinds of really big TV shows that you would know, and yet now, here she is, she's been out of work for two and a half years, doesn't know anybody can help her. She's got eight billion friends on Facebook. I saw this on Facebook yesterday, you should have seen it on Facebook. I said, I don't do Facebook. But she knows nobody. Her friends are not the kind of people who can assist her professionally. How we use technology is critical. Uh, what about work ethic? You, you see that as a problem today? You do? I don't, I don't understand. You know, I, I really don't know if I agree. I, I, I mean, I don't understand what the problem is and why some people get so upset when they drive into a McDonald's drive through mm -hmm. and they get to the ordering location, they roll down the window, and over the speaker, and you know, those are good speakers. They spent a lot of money on that piece. And over the speaker, you hear something. Uh, sometimes I'm not sure it's a human, but, but it's something. Because it sounds something like this, and maybe you can decipher. And, you know, maybe my hearing's not so great. It sounds something like this. Can I help you, please? What did I say? Can I help you, please? You got it. Can I help you? Uh, and so I say, I'd like to have um, a Big Mac, a large order of fries, and a Diet Coke. What did I say? Drive through. What did they say? What did they say? Oh, there it is. Four ninety seven. Please drive through. And so, so I, okay. So that's great. So I drive through, and I get to the next window, right? And, and there's the window, and so I've got my money, and so I. I just about get to the window, I've got my window down, and all of a sudden, that little sliding door window opens up, and I'm thinking, you know, I mean, goodness gracious, I'm thinking there's going to be a face, and they're going to look at me, and they're going to smile, and they're going to say, good afternoon, good afternoon, it's $4.96 for your order. That's what I'm thinking. But what happens? The door slides open, and all of a sudden, hand comes out. <laughs> Nobody says anything. So I'm thinking... High five, <laughs> right? I put the $5 bill on the hand, hand, hand goes back in, window closed. Okay, so I'm sitting in there, my own business. 30 seconds later, window opens, hand comes back out. Full of change. So I'm thinking, fist pump, right? Put my hand under there, money, hand goes back in. Nobody said a word. The window closes. Now, what am I supposed to do? Drive, drive to the next window. Yeah. Pull forward. I drive to the next window. I get to the window. Window opens. Bag comes out. I take the bag. I look around. Nobody's looking at me. Put the bag in there. Get my hand out of the way. 
Hand goes in, window closes. That's been my experience. Are you kidding me? Do you have Chick-fil-A here? Yeah. What happens when you go there? Guess how much more the starting employee makes at Chick-fil-A than McDonald's, Burger King, Hardee's, Arby's, or Crystal. Guess how much per hour more? Nothing. Zero. How, how, I mean, how can that be? Pay them the same, same age, pull them out of the same pool. How many, how many of you have ever had the um, early bird special at Chick-fil-A on Sunday afternoon? Can't get that, can you? Why can't you get that? Why not? They're not open. Why aren't they open? What? The owner doesn't want to be open. Well, why not? What? Christian? Do you think that's why? Because he's a Christian? I wrote a little book one time. It was a little kid's book. A, you know, a board book. It was nine pages long. Each page had three words on it. The title of the book, that, which is irrelevant, but the title of the book was Dear God, Thank you for, and then each page had something to be thankful for as a little kid with these really cool illustrations. So it was thank you for, you know, my my head, you know, this head with this beautiful hair, my bed, and my favorite color red. Okay, so then the next page, dear God, thank you for, okay, my book, you know, my good looks or whatever. Nine pages, three words, twenty-seven words in the whole book. So the guy that owns Chick Fil A is a guy named Ch uh, Truett Cathy who, they, they live in the Atlanta area. That's where they're based. And I never met the guy in my life. But just for fun one day, I sent a copy of that book to True Cathy. Never heard back. Three weeks later, I'm out in the front yard mowing the grass, pushing the lawnmower. And my assistant comes out of the little garage office that I had and says, turn it off, turn it off. So I turn it off and she said, it's a telephone call. I mean, I'm mowing the grass. And I said, who is it? She said, it's True Cathy. I said, oh, you mean like his office? She said, no, Mr. Kathy is on the phone. So, I mean, I am like throwing stuff down, run up the steps, grab the phone, covered in sweat and grass. And I, Hello. And this voice says, Chad? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, Truett Kathy here with Chick-fil-A. I'm thinking, like you need to tell me who you're with, right? <laughs> okay. I said, oh, hi, Mr. Kathy. I said, how are you? And he said, well, Chad, I'm, I'm doing fine. He said, I'm calling to tell you. Tell you how much I appreciate that book you sent to me. And I'm thinking he loves it because, you know, it was a dear God book and he's all very, very much involved in that. And, and, and I said, well, I'm, I'm glad you enjoy it, Mr. Kathleen. And he said, Chad, you know why I enjoy that book so much? I said, no, sir. Why? He said, that's a book I can sit and read in one sitting. All 27 words. <laughs> My point is this. While I had him on the phone, I said, Mr. Kathy, not, not to take too much of your time, but I'm curious, why are you not open on Sunday? And he said, you know, most people think that we close restaurants on Sunday so people can go to church. He said, it has nothing to do with church. He said, we decided from day one that we thought those people who work so hard for us, because we only have really great people working for us, he said, we thought they all deserved to have one day a week where they could not use work as an excuse to be apart from their family. He said, it didn't have to be Sunday. It could have been Tuesday. 
He said, but Sunday seemed like the most reasonable, so that's it. And he said, we'll never be open on Sunday. And when I wrote my financial literacy book, I decided to do a little research. And I calculated what it costs him to close every Sunday. If he tomorrow flipped the switch and decided to open his doors on Sundays, revenue would jump $250 million a year. One day, one switch, one time. But he wouldn't do it. So, anyway, the work ethic at Chick-fil-A is a model like no other. But it's from the top all the way down to the bottom. The guy who cleans the bathrooms and takes out the trash can look at you in the face, converse with you, speak to you, thank you for coming, just as well as the manager who at most Chick-fil-A's doesn't stand behind the counter back there, but walks the store, picks up trash, refills drinks, and thanks his customers for being there. Now, I, to this day, don't understand why they can do that and McDonald's can't. And I have been in thousands of McDonald's, and I also built every Chick-fil-A playground. And I don't understand why they're so different. So let me know when you figure it out. So I don't know. OK, questioning skills. That doesn't seem like a big deal to an adult, to the average adult. But how many times have you been sitting with someone, having a conversation with them, and you feel like, goodness gracious, I'm about to wear myself out trying to keep this conversation going? Because this person I'm with, who I might like, can't carry it, can't do it. Quest the ability to ask questions is a skill. Is a skill. In my first book, I wrote a, a little blip on being how important it was to be interesting, how important it was to be well-read, how important it was to have diverse knowledge, and critically important to be interesting. So when you're talking to people, you have something to talk about. You're interesting. When I got about halfway through my last book, most recent book, I decided that being interesting was important, but being interested was much more important. The ability to talk to people about what they want to talk about. The ability to ask questions relative to what you might like the conversation to be about is an enormous skill that serves so many people so well. And if you really watch some of these super successful people, you'd see that. You'd see their ability to meet someone and express genuine interest in that person and when talking to that person, not talking to that person and wondering if maybe someone more important is getting ready to walk by, maybe I better get out of here so I don't miss the CEO, but literally being interested and sticking with it straight through the conversation. It is absolutely essential, but it's a skill. Something that you could work with, with your students. It involves not only knowledge, interest, eye contact, Shaking hands, focus, body language, all of those things that can make them appear to be interested. You know, well, I'm, I'm up here near Baltimore, so one, when I did the fishing shows, uh, one of the things we did every week was a little side story on something going on in the local community. When we came up to fish in Chesapeake Bay, we did two side stories. One on shucking oysters, so they had me in there slicing my hand open, shucking oysters. And the other one we did was on the Baltimore Orioles. So they took me to their park and had me work out with the team. And in order to do that, which to me was just a monumental thrill and great experience and opportunity because I was a huge fan of Cal Ripken Jr., who, for those of you who don't know, played for the Orioles forever, played more consecutive games than any baseball player in history. Phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. I had always admired him, and he played on the team. And I knew he was going to be there, and I really was hoping I'd get a chance to meet him. So I get there, and as soon as I get there, one of their public relations people takes me down, introduces me to the clubhouse manager, who takes me into this big room and gives me a uniform, because I'm going to put the whole uniform thing on. And he says, as soon as I have the uniform, he says, go right around this corner, through the double doors, and you'll be in the locker room and get changed. OK, so I got the stuff. I go through the locker room. Go through the double doors, open the double doors, and I'm the only one in the whole locker room. All these beautiful mahogany lockers with their names on, except for one guy. There's one other guy in the locker room. Who do you think it is? Cal Ripken Jr. Buck naked. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I don't think I'm going to meet him right now. Right? 
So I turn around. I get myself all dressed up. By the time I get done, he's gone. I go up into the outside area by the stands. All these people in the stands watching practice, waiting, waiting, waiting. So I asked the PR guy, I said, what? He said, they're all waiting for Cal. I said, okay, I mean, autograph. Well, they want, so Cal's not there. So he says, but watch, come here. So I stood over there, and five minutes, I mean, they are waiting. All of a sudden, boop, 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 out of the dugout comes Cal Ripken Jr. He walks straight over to all these fans, lined up against the fence, and he starts right at the beginning, and he sticks his hand out, he shakes hands, he says hello, he signs, signs, shakes hands, good. gets this one person, and I'm not going to do it with you, so he gets to this next person, and he shakes their hand, and he shakes their hand, shakes their hand, shakes their hand, and he won't, and he won't let go of their hand. And so I'm looking at the PR guy, and I said, what, what happened? What's wrong? He said, look at the person he's shaking hands with. And I said, okay, I see him. He said, is he looking at Cal? I said, no, he's not really. He said, well, Cal's not going to let go of his hand until he looks at him <laughs> right in the eyes. He said, because his father taught him that when you shake someone's hand, you look at him right in the eyes. And so Cal Ripken Jr., when anybody shakes his hand, fan, friend, whatever, until they look right in his eyes, he doesn't let go. And I mean, that thing went on for... It, Probably 30 seconds, he just kept shaking a hand, shaking a hand, shaking a hand. So, you know, it, it, the, the guy was probably shocked and, you know, and scared to death to look up. And, and, you know, anyway. So, interested, critically important. Interesting, really good, but interested, critically important. All right, what, what do we have left here? Reading. Why? You, I don't know the answer to this, so you tell me. Why can't... So many kids read. Eighth graders can't comprehend what they read. They don't enjoy reading. Why? Classics. <laughs> oh, I hated to read when I was a kid. Couldn't stand it. Uh, I don't know about you, but I didn't like it. Well, I, I, I think the flip, I think if you haven't been doing it at home forever, you're not going to want to do it in the class. And if you haven't read out loud at home, you won't feel comfortable real out. I also don't think uh, that I want to come and try to ride a bike in front of all my classmates for the first time. So you know, that all had to start at home. And we know that. We know young people who read more at home become better readers. We know all that. We can't fix parents. Look, forget it. Okay? I'm with you. I know that's the problem. I know where it starts. I know that if they all did what they're supposed to do, we'd have a lot of problems solved. We aren't fixing parents. Now, over a period of generations, hopefully parents will get better. But we aren't going to fix them in our lifetime. I have decided that and believe it wholeheartedly. We can keep working, but we're going to get what we get. So the question is, once we get what we get, we get the first grader who's never been read to at home. They can't read. They get to third grade. They still can't read. Now they're in fifth grade, and they're reading at a first grade reading level. That is, to me, why we have the situation we have in this country. Because they didn't get a good start, and they never caught up, and we didn't have some kind of safety net to catch them because we're, I mean, good gracious, educators have enough to do, you know, and don't get paid enough to do what they do. So... Thank you. You want to travel with me? <laughs> My son loves skateboarding. He hates to read. But if I give him a book on skateboarding, he will forget to eat. That's not rocket science. It's just not. I had an eight-year-old stay up the other night Three hours into the night, midnight, on a school night, because he wanted to read the diary of a wimpy kid. Eight years old. He read the whole book in two days. I gave him a book that came assigned from school, some AR book. I've got to pull teeth to get him to read that book. That's right. It's got to be relevant. It has to be interesting to them. Now, do I think that's right? I don't know. Maybe we, when we were kids, they told us to read a book, we read the book, and you know. But I, th that's not who we're dealing with anymore. Well, they, they, 
I, I made the biggest mistake a long time ago. I was giving a speech and I said, in front of a whole bunch of educators, I said, it is important that there be some entertainment value in the classroom. That's what I said, verbatim. Teacher stood up in the middle of my keynote speech and she said, it is not our job to entertain children. And I said, no ma'am, I said, it is critically important that there is some entertainment value in the classroom. So that just gave me a real good picture of how far apart we were. So I agree. They do. And, and if they read something they like, they enjoy it, they'll want to read more. Period. And I don't really think it matters. See, I never read any of the classics until the first one I read, I was 30-something years old because I got picked to be the host of a TV show on ESPN, which sounds great, but the whole show was based on a book called Travels with Charlie by Steinbeck, which I had never read. And so I went and read the book. I thought it was great. But I read the book when I was ready to read the book, when the book was relevant to me and I had an interest in it, and I flew through the book, and man, it was great. But if you stuck the same book in my hand when I was in 10th grade, not only would I not want to read the book, but I wouldn't want to read the next book. It's no different than, look, it, my teacher, when I was a kid, thought, man, we got to bring a speaker into class. And so he or she, she brought in a speaker, and it was, it, you know, it was Emily's aunt, and she was a stockbroker, and she was a very successful stockbroker. And so my teacher called her three weeks early and said, would you speak to my class three weeks from tomorrow? And Emily's aunt got all excited because, you know, that's an honor. And so she's going to speak three weeks from tomorrow, so she goes to work. She's very busy. Very, very successful, very busy. So she goes to work that week, and then the next week, and then the next week, and oh my goodness, she wakes up on Monday, and she realizes, I have to speak at Emily's class tomorrow morning. And so she sits down, and she writes the most boring speech you've ever seen in your life, because she's not a speechwriter. And then she comes into class the next day, all dressed up like a stockbroker, and that doesn't help. And then she proceeds to read her speech because she doesn't know it. In the meantime, half the kids have their head on their desk and they're sleeping. Now, that's terrible for Emily's aunt, who was willing to share her valuable knowledge. That's terrible for Emily's teacher, who had this idea but will certainly never invite anybody back again. And that's terrible for Emily and all of her classmates. Because now they relate speaker to boring. And so they don't listen to the next three speakers, no matter who they are. See? So it's a, it's a domino effect. It could, it could be a stockbroker, but it could be one who can really deliver. Who knows how to speak to kids, the most difficult audience in the world. It could be one who's willing to put on a pair of jeans and have a hole in the knee and some flip-flops and walk in, you know, neatly dressed, but relate and shoot the bull with kids about being a stockbroker and talk about it and bring some props and play some games and, you know, and walk out and everybody think, wow, she was great. And they learned something. In the meantime, my point to the lady in the big crowd was you can learn and laugh at the same time. And sometimes it helps you to learn if you're laughing. So, okay, anything else you want to add to this? Organizational skills? Who knows somebody who's not organized? Who knows somebody that when they look in the mirror, they see somebody who's not organized? Hmm? Okay, you don't have to admit that. I just want to. I wonder, because I think that's something that you learn early in life. My 10-year-old comes home every other day with a backpack, and if I were to take the books out of the backpack, I would find at the bottom of the backpack five or six or eight or 13 pages crumpled up. Some of it's homework, some of it's a study guide, some was from last week, just there. Two broken pencils, three erasers, and some gum wrappers or something. And I look at him and I say, you can't live like that. And it's like, I'm 10. I say, no, no, no. You live like that when you're 10, you're going to live like that when you're 16, and you're going to be a college kid who, you know, trashes it. You, no. Get the paper out, figure out where it goes, put everything where it belongs, and let's get this thing back on track. Foreign. It's foreign. It's foreign to him. The other day, he, we did it, and I said, clean it out, and he pulled out all these papers, and he said, well, I don't need these. I said, good, I'll throw them away. I took them, and I threw them away. The next day, he came to me, and he said, Daddy, I... 
uh, you threw away my study guide for my geometry test. Mm -hmm. I said, I didn't throw away. You gave it to me and told me you didn't need it because it was part of your bird's nest at the bottom of your backpack. I'm a terrible parent. All right, got them. Thinking, writing. What about writing? I think it's just like reading. Let them write something they want to write about. My eight-year-old spent the last three days writing about tigers. He was on the internet for hours researching tigers. You want to know something about tigers? You call him. Mason, he can tell you anything you want to know. Anything. He loves tigers. He wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. And when I said, Mason, you need to correct this sentence, he said, okay, okay. Now, if he had been writing about something that he didn't like, that bored him, Daddy, I don't have to correct that. That's it. Doesn't... Okay. All right. I only have one thing to add to that for all of you. We have an activity on this in a curriculum called High School 101. If I took all of you right now, I put you on a bus, blindfolded you, I drove down the road, stopped, I'll take all of you off the bus, blindfolded, walk you to the back of a building, still blindfolded, and you will start to hear all of this noise. I mean, unbelievable amount of noise. And all I'm going to tell you is, we have just arrived at a huge playground. Okay? A huge public playground. Now, while you still have your blindfolds on, I'm going to ask you, when you take off your blindfold, who do you think you will see? What's your answer? Children? Who, who do you think you'll see? Children? Adults? No, not high school. No, I say high school. I'll, I'll, I'll get more specific for you. A huge public playground for little kids. So we're going to see children, adults, what else? Who else? Who? Who? Parents? Who else? Caregivers. Caregivers, good one. All right. Good list. What are the caregivers going to be doing? Sitting on the bench, talking on their cell phone or to another caregiver. Okay, I'm with you. That's good. Parents, what are they going to be doing? Not talking. And general adults, same. They could be watching. Okay, now, what are the children going to be doing? Playing what? Tell me. Swings? Slides, tag, playing in the dirt, running, jump rope, seesaw, pretending, hide and go seek. That's what they're going to be doing. Okay. And um, how about the kids? Who are they? Well, I mean, are they all white? No. Huh? No, generally, public playground. Think they're all white? Think they're all Hispanic? Asian? Native American? Black? Think they're all tall? Some short ones? Think they're all skinny? Some not so skinny? You think they're all really smart? You think they're all great readers? No. You think they're all Baptist? No. You don't? You think they all have curly hair? Mm -mm. They all have brown eyes? No? They're all different. They're all different. They're all different. And they're all out there doing what? Having, Having fun. Having fun? With whom? Together. Oh, together. Together. Yeah. together. Yeah. Wait, they're black, white, Hispanic, Native American, Asian, tall, short, skinny, not so skinny, smart, not so smart, rich, poor, curly hair, and, and they're playing together? They're all unbelievably, incredibly yeah. different, and they're playing together? How can that be? 
Why, why, would, why would they play together if they're all so different? I mean, some of those kids live in five, 6,000 square foot houses, and some of them live in, in trailers that are falling apart. Why, why would they play together? Because they're all children. They what? They don't care. They don't care about what? You all agree back here in the silent corner? They're all playing together because they don't. They don't care. If I rephrase that and I said they are all playing together because they are not intolerant, what would you say? What would the next word be? One more time. They're all playing together because they are not intolerant. One word. Yes. Yet. Oh. Hello. Just waking you up there. <laughs> Yet. Right? The average three-year-old is not intolerant whatsoever. They get to be five. There's a little bit different picture on the playground, isn't there? At five. Right? They get to be ten. All of a sudden, there's some intolerance creeping in. Is there not? Right? They get to be 15. They're all intolerant of something. Yeah. Say again. They are all intolerant by 15, and at 20, it's rampant. I'm not saying bad, good, or indifferent. I'm just saying it's there. It wasn't there at 3, it's there at 20, 15, 10, lesser degree at 5, but it gets more, which tells us that intolerance is learned. It is a learned behavior, different experiences. It is a learned behavior. Thank goodness. Because if tolerance is a learned behavior, we also know that tolerance can be unlearned. unlearned unlearned. Now, how critical is tolerance to a 15-year-old? We look alike? Don't think we're twins, are we? Um, no? If we're 15 and I go to school with 700 people, we're that different? We look more alike, don't we? Right? Just walk over here. And if that's not happening, I'll yeah, make my way back there because he, he, you know, he kind of, you know, he kind of looked like, right? At three, Nobody's seeing any of that. Everybody's looking through the same rose-colored glasses. We're seeing another person who I'm having fun with, who I'm doing all these things with. It doesn't matter to me. I'm totally, totally not focused on the differences. But when I see you and I focus on those differences, I, eh, I kind of gravitate. I mean, look, I've been in, I don't know, 1,500, 2,000 high schools. If I walk into a cafeteria and it looks like a doggone Oreo cookie. I mean, it is so segregated, it looks like church on Sundays. I'm not saying that's bad. It's not, it's not necessarily bad. But it reminds you that when people focus on differences, this intolerance raises its ugly head. Right? I'll give you a perfect example. Well, let me just ask you. Is anybody in here intolerant of anything? Let me just raise your hand. I'm not going to ask you what, because I'm going to pick on myself. Okay. Most everybody is. I am incredibly intolerant of smokers. <clears throat> I am horrible. I don't like smelling the secondhand smoke. I don't like smelling their clothes after they smoke. I don't like getting in a car where somebody smoked. I don't like walking into a hotel room where somebody smoked. I don't like jumping in a taxi where somebody smoked. I don't like being in a restaurant where somebody smoked outside as I walked in. I don't like walking down the airport concourse and walking by the smoking room. I can't stand it. 
I don't like people who throw cigarette butts out the window. Hello. I don't like any of that. I am unbelievably intolerant of people who smoke. And I need to change. That's my problem. It's not their problem. It's mine. Uh, it is. It's my problem. There is no reason in the world that I should be intolerant of someone who smokes simply because they smoke. Now, if they come blow smoke in my face, that's different. But just because they smoke. But I am. And I need to work on that. I need to do something about that. Because it can affect my relationship with people. Some of whom I need to have a relationship with. Okay? So, that's my problem. Intolerant. Horrible. That's the difference. If we focus on differences. Now watch this. I'm going to let you guys do some aerobics here for a second. I am going to point you in the direction, four directions of the corners of this room based on a little criteria. When I tell you, if you would please, stand up and walk to the corner of the room that you are choosing. This is the criteria. We're going to talk about music, okay? Music is our category. And in this corner right here is southern rock music. Got it? Rock. This corner right here is country music, all right? Rock, country. That corner back there is gospel music, all right? And that corner, I'm going to put over here by the door so we don't hit the camera, is going to be rap. Now, let me go through that. Rock, country, gospel, and rap. Now, in 10 seconds, I want you to get up. Walk to the corner that most closely represents your preference of those four. Okay? You have to go to some corner, so it's either rock, country, gospel, or rap. Go to your corner. Gather up in your corner. Good. All right, everybody there? What? Okay, <laughs> this is great. Look at the people in your corner. Take a good look. All right, see them? This is all rock. Everybody here is rock? Okay, take a good look at them. Okay, got them? See them? Everybody that likes rock? Okay, go back to your seats. Quick as you can. Quick as you can. Get the blood flowing, see that? How about that? Okay. Now, new category. Automobile. Right here, BMW convertible. Ah, 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 not yet. So. <laughs> right here, three BMW convertible. No. BMW convertible, right there. Lexus SUV, right there. Back here, Volkswagen Beetle, all right? And back here, Ford F-250 pickup. I'm going to go through it again. Back here, Ford F-250 pickup. Volkswagen Beetle, right here. Lexus SUV, here. And BMW convertible, go. Yeah, well, your preference, if you had to choose one of those, go. You make a beetle big enough Okay, now, look at the people in your corner. Same people? Some, some same, but some different, right? Okay. You have just moved into a new corner with some new people with whom you have something in common, right? Fair enough? Okay. Here's the point. I'm doing this activity in Texas last year. I have 500 teachers from across the state, all across the state. Different types of teachers, different everything, different parts of the state. That's a big state, by the way. 
17 hours to drive across that state, okay? Big place. And so I'm in the midst of this, right here, this activity, with automobiles. And I've got a BMW convertible, I've got a Ford F-250 pickup, I've got a Volkswagen Beetle, but I don't have a Lexus. Over in this corner right here, I have a Harley Davidson motorcycle, okay? So I said, just like I said to you, everybody was sitting down, I said, okay, ready? Here where the cars are, I said, everybody, get up and go to your corner. Well, 500 teachers running and bumping into each other and trying to get to their corner, and I'm screaming at them, faster, faster, and they're going all over, and they're having a blast. Everything's just really, really funny. All these corners are getting filled up, about 60 men. Now, you know what the average ratio of men to women is in a group of teachers, so just about every darn guy in the place is heading to the Harley-Davidson corner, which I expected. And they got up there pretty much over there, there just a few people mingling around, and I look up, and all of a sudden, out of this corner of the room, which is way over there, this 60-something-year-old African-American woman stands up and starts walking right down here. And about the same time, all the way over in that corner, this 20-something-year-old newbie teacher, clearly white girl, stands up and she starts walking across, across. And when they get about halfway through the building, it's apparent that they're both heading in the same direction. And so they look at each other, and as soon as they catch each other's eyes, they start to smile. And they keep going, and they're getting closer and closer and closer, and they're both heading to the Harley-Davidson corner. And now they are really smiling. And so they keep coming, and they keep coming, and they keep coming, and they get to the Harley-Davidson corner, and they stand there, and they start talking. And I'm watching this whole thing. Now, everybody else is settled and quiet like you are and you are and you are. And so I'm ready to start. I'm ready to talk about whatever it is I need to talk about. And I say, oh, and I look over. And these two women are still completely ignoring me. And they're talking and talking and laughing and talking. And so I wait about 10 more seconds thinking, you know, I mean, somebody's going to be quiet. I mean, <laughs> who raised these people, right? And so I let, now I see one of them pull a pen out of her purse and a piece of paper, and, she, and she's writing something as she's talking and talking and talking, and they won't shut up. They will not stop talking. So I watch her hand the card to the other girl, and they're clearly exchanging some kind of information, right? And they will not shut up. And right then it hit me. Those two ladies, one was 60-something African-American from West Texas, standing next to a 20-something white girl from Houston, Texas. One taught in some kind of school. The other did something else at a different school across the state. And they were exchanging information because they were going to go and ride their Harley-Davidson motorcycles together. As different as they were, they didn't know each other when they walked into the room. They had no idea until they figured out that they had one similarity. And that one similarity, when focused on, brought them together like magnets you've never seen, and they were inseparable because of one similarity. And it made me remember and realize again that if we, all of us, can focus on similarities and not differences, we can break this cycle of intolerance we can unlearn it, and we can develop relationships much more quickly, much stronger than we would otherwise. Now, as a student, that's important, because if you play on a basketball team, you need to be tolerant. I mean, there are going to be people from all walks of life. If you play in the band, there are going to be people from all walks of life. Old, young, male, female, rich, poor, and tolerance is critically important. Socially, tolerance is important. If I have a friend who's not exactly like me, and I'm intolerant of that, I might lose a friendship. That's all good. That's all fine and well. But if intolerance enters the workplace, it is fatal. And here's why. How many of you in this room today, the first day you walk in for your job that you currently have, you were allowed to walk in and choose your boss? Nobody. How many of you in this room today, on your first day, were allowed to walk in and choose 
every one of your coworkers? Nobody? Okay. How about this? How many of you, when you got your job and you came in on day one, were allowed to walk in and choose your customers, which are the students? How many of you got to choose all your students? Nobody. Nobody. And that is the case in 99.9% .9 of jobs in America. You cannot choose your boss or supervisor. You cannot choose your coworkers. And you cannot choose your customers. Therefore, if you walk into any professional environment intolerant of anything, you will struggle. And it could be fatal. I'm a perfect example. 90% of the time that I get hired to speak, today included, I'm hired by a female. 90% of the time. There are a lot of men who are intolerant when it comes to working with females. There are a lot of women who are intolerant when it comes to working with men. But if I was in that category, if I just decided I'm no longer intolerant of smokers, now I'm intolerant of women, I'd be out of business. I would be broke. I'd be done. One simple intolerance unless I focus on the similarities. So professionally, you need to be thinking about your students. What is your student going to say if they get their first job and they get placed in this cubicle and in this cubicle, their cubicle mate is gay? What are they going to say? How are they going to handle that? Or what if they come to work here and right next to them, they're going to work next to a Muslim? What are they going to say? What, what, if they, what if they go to work and the first customer that they call on that gets into their car hasn't bathed in two weeks? But it's their customer. What are they going to do? What are they going to do? See? My four, fourth grader walks into a classroom and has a teacher who's deaf. What if, he, what if he's intolerant of disability? How's he going to get through there? The secret to breaking the cycle, to unlearning intolerance, is to focus on similarities and not differences. It's not complicated, but it's not easy. Okay, go back to your seat. <laughs> she says, I want to hang out with my new Lexus friends. <laughs> Good for you. <clears throat> Alrighty. Uh, as we head towards close here, a couple of things I always like to do. Uh, first of all, in about three minutes, I'm going to take questions. Anything you want to talk about at all related to what we discussed today or a little off the subject, but whatever you'd like to talk about. And um, any, then also, before then, though, I would like any suggestions that you all might have for you know, these types of events and presentations. Unfortunately, we don't have time for criticism, but we can, you know, maybe next time. Yeah. Yeah, so. Anyway, uh, any suggestions on what we talked about today or kind of what went on? Give me, give me some feedback, if you would. Communication skills. I don't have those. <laughs> okay, any questions? You're not going home, I'm just telling you. Any questions? More activities? Yeah. I do a workshop. We wrote a curriculum called High School 101 that covers almost all of these, and we have three or four, uh, up to seven activities in each unit. And if I have a, you know, like a six-hour block, I actually take everybody through all of those activities. Uh, and, I, and I think it's a good thing. You know, those are things you can take right back into the classroom. Anything else? Any other questions? You guys left off <coughs> one skill. Well, we didn't leave it off. We didn't talk about it. And that was the financial literacy. Uh, I mean, you heard, if you're in today, you heard that, but the financial literacy situation is, is horrible. And 
it, in, in is that in Virginia or Maryland? Right here. Oh, yeah. It is in about 13 states a requirement now. Mm -hmm. But whatever you can do to incorporate it, it's just, just so important. And, you know, it's interesting. What we're finding across the country is that it has nothing to do with socioeconomics. I mean, you know, there are families making $400,000 a year that are broke at the end of every year, and their families making 30000 that have saved 5000 So it's, uh, there's no rhyme or reason. But, but that is definitely a skill that young people are not learning at home. And here's why. If I'm 15 or 16, I live in a household, and the combined income of my two parents is $50,000, and we have a TV on the wall that costs $2,500. And there's a car in the driveway that's financed for six years that costs $40,000. When it's my turn to make a choice, what do you think I'm going to do? Yeah, it, it, you can't blame me. That, I mean, that, you can't. So letting them understand, helping them understand the difference between needs and wants. Not dictating, but difference between be aware of. Because I said it the other day, I was in a school and... I don't know, 800 kids came in, 600 of them had on blue jeans. And so after they all got seated, I said, if you're wearing a pair of blue jeans right now, stand up. 600 stood up. I said, if you're wearing a pair of blue jeans right now and those blue jeans have a hole in them, stay up. If not, sit down. 300 kids stayed up. And I said, okay. If you're wearing a pair of blue jeans right now that has a hole in it and that hole was in those jeans the day you bought them, stay up. If not, sit down. 50 kids stayed up. And so I looked at the group and I said, is there something wrong with these people? I mean, are they bad people? No, they're not bad people. They just thought they needed a hole in their jeans the day they bought them. Right? And most of them paid a premium for the hole. When in fact, they just wanted a hole in their jeans. And so I tell that story and then, and then a couple of people look at me and say, oh, gee, Chris, man, these, we're just talking about blue jeans here. And I always say, you're right, we're just talking about blue jeans today. But in three years, that same kid who thinks they need a hole in their jeans the day they buy them, that same kid is going to have to buy a vehicle. And they're going to either have to decide that they need a car or they just want the car. They need transportation, and there's a $13,000 Toyota that is four years old that works. They want that $40,000 SUV that their best friend's dad has. So what do they buy? And that's just a car, so I guess that's really not that big a deal. But five years later, it's going to be a house. Yeah, it's going to be a house. They need a place to live. They need a couple of bedrooms and maybe two baths. But they want a 3,500 square foot house that costs $300,000 and has four bedrooms and three baths and a swimming pool because somebody they know has one. So what decision do they make? Hole in the jeans, brand new SUV, 3,500 square foot house. That is how we got into the mess we're in. Now, now, now. Yeah. I, I, I struggle with this most of my career. And, well, I think in the more affluent areas, it, it is a value system issue. And, and, it, and it, um, I'm a school counselor. So when I'm talking to parents about the child's grade and the, the teacher's there, and it, it comes down to a value issue. What does the parent value and what do they um, give the child? And it, it is a struggle. Yeah. You know what's interesting to me is I really think it crosses all socioeconomic lines. I mean, I'll, I'll just go ahead and fess up. I, I married a doctor, and when I got married, my doctor wife brought $10,000 of credit card debt into our family. I mean, how can that be? How? So it's not, it's not just certain people. It's, it's people who never learn. You use a credit card, you pay it off at the end of the month. Period. And you only buy things you need. Period. 
I mean, that's why there's a period at the end. <laughs> okay, anything else? All right, well, thank you all for coming. Enjoyed it. God bless. <laughs>